I want to talk about where we are with ITC. What is going on with ITC that is causing so much chaos and is causing the pass rates to be where they are? And this is really important if you're in CTA as well or moving into CTA because you need to be aware that you're being prepared for ITC. So what you're seeing in ITC is going to be popping up in your final exam. So you cannot afford to say, oh, that's ITC, I'm writing ITC next year or maybe the year after, and so therefore it doesn't affect me. Let's talk about where we are, what's happening, and I'm hoping that this can give us um, some stuff to talk about in terms of what it is. what do we need to do? What do we need to change? What's going wrong? Why is this looking... Why is this so difficult? What's happening? Okay, so let's talk about this. The first thing we have to be aware of is the purpose of these exams and what they're doing. And this is really important because the structure of your exams and the skills and the requirements that that they have is based on where you need to be, right? So Saika is looking at the future and saying, look, in the future, people are going to expect X, Y, Z from their chartered accountants, from their CAs. What are those things? What is it that CAs are going to need to be able to do, have, know, et cetera, in the future? And they're going to be preparing you for that, right? So that works itself all the way back. You know, the in articles, you need to be doing this in order to meet that future requirement. In, you know, APC, you need to be doing this, et cetera. And it all builds up to this, the future, okay? Now, the future, when we talk about it, it's very easy to say, oh, you know, there's AI and there's, uh, you know, the fourth industrial revolution and all the rest of this. And, you know, I'm going to have to, maybe I need to do programming courses or whatever the case is, but let's just back up a moment and ask, what does this mean for us practically if we're writing exams? And the, one of the really important things here is the fact that the focus is on skills over knowledge. The APC is called a professional exam, and we don't necessarily really think about what that actually means, the difference between technical and professional, but one of those things, one of those elements is the fact that I need you to use your knowledge, right? I need you to use your knowledge. As a CA, you have knowledge. You have a lot of knowledge tax, financial accounting, auditing knowledge, et cetera. You've got a lot of knowledge. But the challenge we sit with where we are and going forward is that so does everyone else, right? All the years that you've been spending trying to perfect and master the tax law, it's on Google. ChatGPT can do it, right? So what is it that you can do that a computer can't do? What is it that you can do that Google and ChatGPT can't do? What does the world need you for, right? In the past, if we take the internet, if you will, out of the equation, how were people supposed to know what the tax law said? They needed someone who knew the tax law, right? They needed to go to someone who knew the tax law. So in the past, if you will, knowledge, and you'll know that saying, right? Um, you may remember that saying, knowledge is king, right? Knowledge is king. Used to be a very common phrase. Why? Because very few people had high levels of knowledge and normal people, layperson, society went to these people to say, look, I don't know what the tax law says. What am I supposed to do here? I don't know how the financials are supposed to look. What am I supposed to do here? And so people who were professionals, they held the knowledge, right? But that's not what we're looking at anymore. Anybody with Google can find this, can get depreciation calculations, impairment calculations, ChatGPT can do it. There is a huge amount of knowledge that everyone has access to. So the question you have to ask yourself is what is your value add, right? What is your value add? The value add, society expects you to be able to problem solve, right? Not problem match, not I've done these questions before and they look really similar and so I'm going to take the solutions from those and I'm going to put them in here. No, 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 no. I need you to be solving new problems, problems you've never seen before, problems that are half of this and half that and something weird and all the rest of this and I've messed it up and I don't know what I'm doing and this one did half of that. You are going to have to be the one who solves the weird, new, strange, complicated problems that no one else can. 
if I could get it from a textbook, if it's a copy and paste, I can get it off the internet. I can get it off Google. I can get it off ChatGPT. I don't need you. So what do I need you for? I need you to solve my problems, which means to a large extent, your job is to customize solutions for your different clients or for society or companies, whoever you're working for. Okay. You are customizing solutions. Your job is to apply knowledge to completely new situations that you've never seen before and go, what are you? How are you doing? It? Okay, hold on. Let me think about this. All right. If you're doing that and that, this is the knowledge that applies. That knowledge does not apply. Okay, I need a little bit of this. I need a little bit of that. I need a little bit of this. Okay, that's the stuff that's relevant for you. And then I need to be able to communicate the solution to you and go, okay, okay, so what you need to do, first of all, you need to think about this. And then you need to think about that. And then after that, you need to do this. And you got to be aware that the law says X, Y, Z. And so you've got to be very careful that you follow this and do it in this order. Most people are going to mess this up, okay? So there's a risk here that you haven't done this, that, and the other. And are you aware that you're going to be paying capital gains tax on this, right? So you are the one that's supposed to identify all the issues, raise the stuff, because your client's just sitting there going, hey, I spent money on stuff. What do I do with it? I don't, I don't know. Yeah. I spent a whole bunch of money. I bought this thing, and I was talking to a friend of mine of a supper, and he said that I can deduct it all for tax, and so, you know, I can decrease my tax bill. And you're like, okay, slow down. <laughs> what did you buy again? Let me take a look at it. Give me the contract. Let's identify what it actually is. What are the tax implications? What's the accounting requirements? Like, let's just slow down and see what's going on here, right? Your job is to customize solutions, practically apply and communicate. Your job is to identify the stuff no one else can do. That is what you're going to be doing. So the value add for you or the value add society expects of you is not how well do you know the tax law? It's how well can you use the tax law to apply it to me? Now, exams are tricky. The exam environment is tricky because to some extent, to a large extent, it doesn't represent the real world. Where the real world, you have all the knowledge at your fingertips and your job is to figure out how to use it, right? Whereas exams, to a large extent, you know, coming through the qualification, there are still a huge, way too many exams that force you to remember the stuff and then, and then use it. And so that's tricky, right? And it's almost like if you think about the mental energy required in these exams, it's kind of like if there's a lot of remembering that you have to do because you don't have the knowledge in the exam, then the levels of the exam are generally a little bit... I'm not going to say easier, but in terms of application and problem solving, the levels of the exam are normally a little bit lower. Why? Because I realize that a large portion of your effort and your time and your stress is sitting in the remembering part, right? If I remove the remembering part, then I use that mental energy for application and communication. So it's almost like a swing, you know, it's almost like a, a seesaw where if there's a huge amount of stuff you have to remember, there's generally less application. If there's not a lot that you have to remember because you've got knowledge at your fingertips, then the levels of application are a lot higher. The application communication, the professional skills are a lot higher. And you can see this in the exams from first year, second year, you know, and, and to some extent third year as well, although that's changing in a lot of aspects where the knowledge is a lot higher and the types of the questions the application levels, the communication, the problem solving is a little bit lower. Then you get to CTA um, where, okay, you're now allowed to take the books into the exam. So as far as the examiners are concerned, they're saying, look, you've got the books in front of you. You have all the knowledge in front of you. Now your job is to use it. And so you see a massive shift in the value or the power of knowledge, right? Now the key issue is, look, can you use that knowledge? Can you create a solution for a problem you've never seen before? Can you build a solution for this person based on an industry you've never touched before, based on a situation you've never seen, a transaction you may never have dealt with before? Can you break down who they are, what they're doing, what is it, and build a solution for these people? Can you do that? Okay, that's CTA. ITC is kind of going, can you integrate all the stuff? Are you able to problem solve, apply, communicate, et cetera? Okay. So when we look at where we've been versus where we are, we can see a massive shift in the importance of 
knowledge, application, communication, problem solving. In the past, knowledge was more important. So we spent a lot of time remembering stuff, learning stuff, the details, the knowledge. The, we spent a huge amount of time. The concern we have is if you continue to spend most of your study time on the knowledge, you're going to have a problem because this stuff does not happen automatically, right? Knowledge does not automatically turn into the ability to apply it to new clients. Knowledge does not automatically turn in the ability to communicate what you're thinking. And we know that. It's very frustrating, but we know that. Yvonne, I know the work, but these discussion questions kill me. Why? Because knowledge does not equal communication. These are two different concepts. You're not automatically able to communicate something just because it's in your head. These are different skills. So you need to ask yourself, where am I spending most of my study time? Right now, let's take a look at APC, for example, the second board exam. So what's going on there? The game factor has been removed from APC, right? Which means it's a professional exam that's saying, look, can you do the job? Can you do the job? Either you can do the job or not. Undergrad, CTA, ITC, to a large extent, it's a game. And the game is can you get 50% in the exam in a limited time with limited resources for something that you've never seen before? So to some extent, it's a game. It's a very serious game, obviously, but it's a game, right? There are game elements in there where I've got to get in there, get as much as possible, as fast as possible, and get out. But that is not the same as saying, look, you need to do the job properly, right? You cannot go to your client and go, well, I got your tax calculation half right, so you're fine. I know I forgot about you know, your CGT, but that's fine because I got the other half right. That's not how the world works, right? So APC has removed the game factor, which is basically saying, look, if I give you time, if you get to know the client, if you get to know the industry, if you get to know the transactions, are you able to solve problems? Are you able to communicate stuff? Are you able to apply what you know to this? Which is why you get the case study much earlier, like five days before, you're able to go through all the stuff, do your research, make notes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You get so much more time in the exam. They've removed all the limitations, right? That most students think is the reason that ITC is so challenging, right? So for students struggling with ITC and CTA, if you said to them, what is it that makes ITC or CTA so difficult? And there are certain things that generally come up first. Um, never seen the case study before, so I don't know what's going on, and there's a lot of information to go through, so I'd like understand. understate. Time pressure, and I don't know what I'm supposed to be working towards. So it could be anything. I have to take all my knowledge in with me and then hope that whatever it is that comes up, I'm able to deal with, right? So the limits on time, the completely unseen case study that you have to solve immediately, and the fact that I have to go in there with so much knowledge in my head that I have to have remembered, worked on, thought about, et cetera, et cetera. And I have to come in with all of this knowledge and then go, okay, which one of these, which things of these do you need is the reason that ITC is so difficult. Okay. All right. If that were true, then everybody would be passing APC with 100%. There would be a 100% pass rate in APC. Because all the stuff that you're quoting as reasons the ITC exam is so difficult have been removed from APC. The time limitation, resource limitation, the fact that you don't know who the client is, you don't know the case study, you don't know the industry, you've got time to do all of this. And yet the APC pass rate is sitting at somewhere about 60%-ish, give or take, depending on which year we're looking at, et cetera. Point is, it's nowhere near 100%. Okay, something's off here. These are people who have at least 18 months of articles. They've passed a board course and now they're writing. This is right at the end here and only six out of 10 of them can pass. And there's none of these game factors, none of these limitations that students think is causing the problem in ITC. So something else is going on. Something else is happening. There is something else getting in the way that students are not dealing with. What is it? It's this stuff. Just because you know the work does not mean that you're able to put it in a coherent sentence. 
and tell me exactly what's going on. Just because you know the work does not necessarily mean that you're able to create a solution for someone else. If all you've ever done is learn, if I see that, I do that. If I see that, I do that. When I give you something completely new, what are you going to do? Well, I, I don't know. I haven't seen that question before, and so I, I don't have a solution for it. You're sitting with an APC here. These are the skills that are required, and people are kind of struggling with that. So the problem you have now is that you've got APC over here. You've got ITC over there. If these two are quite far away from each other, it means that people are coming out of the ITC not quite on track to have the skills needed for APC. So if someone's coming out here and they're moving in this direction, they're never going to hit APC. So what we have to make sure people are doing is shifting the trajectory so that once you come out of ITC, you're on the road to get to APC, which means we've got to make sure that the ITC exam is focusing you on the skills that you're going to need to have mastered, if you will, for the APC. So if the ITC exam was purely technical, for example, and it's all just formats and disclosures and calculations, it puts you on a trajectory of, I'm really good at disclosures. I'm really good at preparing financial statements. I can't discuss anything. It's going to mean that you never hit the APC. And so this trajectory has shifted. If you take a look at past ITC exams and you go backwards, and a lot of people do this, obviously, because when you're studying for ITC, you go through past papers. And you look at where we are now, last year, previous year, go back a few exams, go back five, six years and notice the change in questions and the change in the structure of the exams and the change in the portion of the exam that was based on discussion, for example, as an oversimplification, right? Five, six, seven, eight years ago, you will see the shift in the exam from very technical based to very professional based. Why? Because that's what we're working towards. Now, the challenge that we have is that we're not used to this stuff. We don't really know what it is, one. And two, in all honesty, we don't really prioritize it. This is like, you know, people talk about this as like soft skills. You know, there's an essence and a sense that the technical knowledge is what makes me smart, right? So there's, to some extent, there's a very high level of priority and focus and value placed on the knowledge, on the theory, on the technical stuff which is completely understandable, but it's very dangerous. Very dangerous, okay? So students kind of have the habit of saying, well, Yvonne, once I've got all my knowledge, then I will start working on these. But the problem is then you start seeing this as what we call or what students like to call exam technique, which is kind of like my knowledge is the most important thing. And then my exam technique, my ability to do discussion questions is like the little icing that I put on the cake afterwards. That's like the bridging. My preparation is technical. And then two weeks before the exam, I do a little bit of exam technique, which is like, what do the examiners want to see? What format do the examiners want to see this in? And so I'm just going to add a little exam technique, like a little slice that's just going to bridge me from my knowledge to the exam. So the, the comment or the, te the terminology of exam technique drives me nuts, right? The ability to communicate is not a little tweak that you need to put in after you know everything. The ability to communicate is a fundamental skill that you have to work on a lot, right? So the concept of exam technique is very much, let's give you some tips about exam technique. No, no, no. These are fundamental skills, right? It's a very, very big difference. So the focus shift is massive. Where most of my students stand is somewhere here. At the moment, you're standing on like the precipice of the past and the future. And it is incredibly challenging. And I mean, I make this quite extreme and all the rest of this because I want you to see the picture and I want you to understand that I totally get where this comes from. I totally get where you are, why you are. I totally get that. I'm not judging you for that. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with you, but you've got to understand the bigger picture so that you can make decisions. The challenge we have is most students base their studying on the past. Because that's how you got here. So it feels logical. Like if that's what I did in the past to pass exams, it makes sense to keep doing that. And we have a tendency as human beings to keep doing the same thing until it doesn't work anymore. And to some extent, even when it stops working, we're like, okay, I'm going to do the same thing and I'm going to do it a lot harder. I'm going to do more of it because that must be wrong. So we're still studying based on the past. In the past, in order to pass exams, I needed to spend all of this time on knowledge, 80% of my time on knowledge, and I need to know this and know this and know this. So you're perfecting the ability to operate like Google. 
except that you'll never get there because Google's so much better than you. You're spending all your time learning to be a computer. And you are completely ignoring the fact that the massive volume or the massive percentage of the skills that you need is not going to come from your knowledge of how deep a text works. It's not. If you want to know what's going on, you need to be studying towards the future. You need to be looking at the future and going, what are they doing in APC? If you're in CTA, what are they doing in ITC? How does this affect me? Because that's where I'm heading. Whatever university you are in CTA, they are watching ITC and going, well, if that's what you need to be able to do in ITC, that's what we need to be examining you on. And so they shift and make sure that you are prepared for what's coming next. Whereas we have a tendency to go, that's what I did last year. And yeah, there's a very big difference. So we kind of go, oh, AI and, you know, the fourth industrial revolution. And what does this mean? We all have to go into programming. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, fine. You know, all of those may be true. But the biggest, biggest impact for you is if everybody has the same knowledge as you, what value do you have? You've got to shift your understanding of value from I'm the one who knows the tax law to what? Well, I'm the one who can do what for you? What can I do? And this is huge. This is huge. If we've spent all these years studying to learn all of this knowledge, it feels like a massive kick in the gut. And it is. It is. It's huge. It's scary. It's terrifying. But we've got to make that shift. So if you're spending 70 to 80% of your time on knowledge, what's happening here? What's happening here? When, when are you working on these fundamental skills of problem solving, of being able to build solutions, of being able to apply stuff, of being able to communicate what you know? Where, where is this time? It's very, very tricky. But where you are, you've got to take an honest look and go, what am I spending my studying doing? What am I focusing on? If I'm focusing on deeper tax, I don't know why I always come to deeper tax. <laughs> if I'm focusing on technical knowledge, is that where I'm heading? Is that what they want from me? No, they want you to critique someone else's work. They want you to recommend what you should be doing. They want you to advise. They want you to discuss the weaknesses. They want you to correct. They want you to explain. They want you to instruct. That doesn't come automatically. That doesn't come automatically. And it, it is a little, and we kind of like, yeah, but Yvonne, surely, you know, if it's, if I know the work, then the rest is going to, you know, it'll, it'll be a lot easier. Yeah, I beg to differ. I beg to differ. And anyone that has tried to do discussion questions will realize that what trips them up is not the knowledge. It's how do I say this? Where, where do I start? What am I supposed, how, what, what level of detail am I supposed to go into? Like, how do I structure my sentence? Is that now close enough to the solution? Far away, I use the same words, but I'm not coming up with the same thing. The ability to communicate your thoughts is not automatic. It takes skill. It's a skill. I can use exactly the same level exactly the same level of knowledge and depending on what I want you to do with it it's going to completely change your marks okay so let's take a very very silly example very small example depreciation for example the concept of depreciation is something that we've been dealing with since first year so nice and simple right if I said I want you to calculate depreciation fine everybody's passing I want journals, everybody's passing. I want you to disclose in the AFS, everybody's passing. Not a problem, right? Um, if I said to you, I want you to explain to your client how to calculate depreciation, marks are going to start dropping. Why? Because we're not used to taking a calculation that we're able to just write out the calculation, step back and go, how would I explain this to someone else? it slows you down. The depreciation calculation that you could do in two minutes now takes 10 minutes to try and think about it's exactly the same steps, but how do I say it? Where do I start? How do I explain to someone what numbers they need to take? Right? It would be different 
if I gave you the amounts versus just a general question, right? So if I said to you, here's the case study, here's all the details, here's all the amounts, now go and, go and explain how they should calculate depreciation, it would be a lot easier because you'd say, okay, you need to take um, you know, the 100,000 for the cost price and then multiply it by the 12 or whatever the case is, that would be a lot easier. But if I said to you, just go and explain to your clients how to calculate depreciation, you now don't have amounts, you don't have specifics. So you need to find, it just takes a bit longer to go, okay, I'm, okay first you need to go and find the cost price. Uh, of the asset and then you need to make sure that you've allocated you know all the costs associated and capitalized all that and expense the right stuff the explanation takes a lot of time but it's a skill to be able to turn that calculation into a discussion if i said to you i want you to critique the depreciation calculation that your client has done or your junior has done or that chat gpt came up with you're going to have to sit and look at what they've done and compare it to what they should have done and go, okay, whoa, whoa, whoa. you kind of did, where did you get that from? Why did you do that? Where, okay, you shouldn't have done that. You should be doing that. Where does that come from again? Critiquing is a different skill. I need to compare what you've done to what you should have done and then identify the differences. Got that right, got that wrong. It's a completely different skill. Not nearly the same as just going, let me just calculate it. That's nice and easy. Calculations, nice, easy, and fast. Explanations, critiquing, very different. If I ask my students, explain why they're depreciating stuff, I'm going to get a pass rate of like 20%. Why? Because we've calculated depreciation since first year, but we've never had to articulate, guess what, why are we doing it? Well, because the standards say so. Can we really articulate the importance of or the value of or the need for depreciation? And if we can, how much time does it take us to get our thoughts together? Because that's not, you know, if I say, here's the information, go and calculate depreciation, you can start working on it almost immediately because you've got like format. You've got a formula in your mind. You go, okay, first I need to do this, then I need to do that. And that, that's a lot faster. But if I say to you, I want you to tell me why it's important, for example, it takes a lot longer for you to sit back and go, okay, good question. Okay, uh, where do I start? Like, what do I need to say? So if nothing else, the time factor involved in this is tricky, but it's the same depreciation. It's the same depreciation. But what I'm asking you to do with it is completely different. Most of our students will be very comfortable with these types of questions. Those are knowledge-based questions. Students struggle with these. They're professional-based questions and they are tougher. They take longer. They're less formulaic. Because how do I structure my sentence? What do I say? Oh, I end up waffling. I end up focusing on the wrong thing. I leave stuff out. It is trickier. This is where you need to be. And if you're spending all your time, okay, now I want to know the calculation perfectly, and then I'm going to spend two weeks turning it into an explanation, you're in trouble because this is a skill that you have to master, which requires repetition. It requires time. You've got to spend your time. I talk about it as skills that you own versus skills that you know, right? So when you own the skill, it's something you can do smoothly. It's something that you go, okay, Vaughn, I need you to do it. It's a discussion question. Okay, here, where do let me go. As opposed to, Vaughn, I need you to do a discussion question, which is like, okay, let me take it from, okay, where, where do I begin? Okay, what am I supposed to do? Okay, I need like a little format in my head of what I need to discuss, break it down. Okay, what am, okay, what am I supposed to do next? That's not a skill that you own. That's a skill that you know that you're trying to get used to using, but you're still in the learning curve. These exams expect you to own these skills. So students say to me, okay, Vaughn, but you told me how to do discussion questions and I know how to do those discussion questions. Yes, but do you own that? Do you own it? It's like learning to drive a car. You get to a point where you're like, okay, I can drive a car, but I really have to focus on it. it takes me time to think about it. I really got to think about it. When I get to a right turn, it kind of freaks me out a little bit. And so I have to breathe. That is a skill that I know that I really have to focus on versus at some point in time, I'm just able to get in the car and drive. It's just natural. A skill that you know is not necessarily a skill that you own. So a lot of students say to me, but Yvonne, I did do discussion questions when I, when I was practicing and 
um, you know, I know how to do them. Yes, but do you own that skill? And that comes with practice. It comes with repetition. It comes with doing more different situations, continually different situations so that the skill that you have is the ability to operate within new and uncertain environments. As a professional, I need to know that I can dump you in any situation, any industry, anywhere with any transaction, and you will be able to do something, something. And that, to a large extent, a large part of the challenge that students have is just the ability to stay calm when they come across something they've never seen before, because it's terrifying. Oh, they, I was hoping they wouldn't ask me this. This is a topic that I really hate. I don't know what they want from me. I can't. Ever. The ability to stay calm in uncertain situations is, is it's a skill that you have to practice. And the best way to train for that is to keep putting yourself in uncertain situations, right? You can't train for uncertainty by staying in certainty. You can't say, well, I'm going to spend all my time studying two weeks before the exam. I'm going to do a whole bunch of questions. In the exam, you've got nothing but uncertainty. And so you panic. And I don't understand why I couldn't stay calm and I couldn't focus and I couldn't think about what I'm doing. In order to prepare for uncertainty, you need to work in uncertainty, which means questions all the time, continually. Not questions I've prepared for, but I'm going to do an XYZ question. I'm, so I'm going to spend six hours revising that section so I go into that knowing everything. <laughs> no, that's not how it worked because that's not how the exam works. Your exam is based on the future. What do I need in the future? Your question for yourself in your prep needs to be, am I studying based on the past? Am I looking at what used to work and going, yeah, but when I used to do that, that worked, that got me through, that's what I know, that's what I'm comfortable with. Guys, unfortunately, knowledge for us is a comfort zone. I always say to my students, you're addicted to theory. I cannot get you away from theory. You're like, you're addicted to the stuff like a drug. If I turn my back and leave you alone, you're heading straight back to theory, straight back to revision. Why? Comfort. Because you always have that hole, that feeling of like, but Yvonne, I don't know enough. I don't know enough. I don't know enough. I don't know enough. And so I'm not ready to do questions yet. I'm not ready yet. I'm not ready yet because I don't know enough. I don't know. It's a comfort zone. Your idea of competence, your feeling of competence is if I know my work, I'll pass. That is your feeling of competence. In reality, the feeling of competence needs to be your ability to create new solutions for completely uncertain situations. It's a totally, totally different world. And you're standing in the middle of it. You have your whole life been prepared for one type of exam. You have developed all your learning skills and all your studying skills to operate in a world where knowledge is the most important thing. All our education system focused on the importance of knowledge. And now they're sitting and they're going, yeah, okay. So if everyone in the world has exactly the same knowledge as you, what do I need you for? Good question. I'm going to have to figure out where I fit in. So understanding the bigger picture of the future and the past, understanding what we're working towards, I'm hoping, take some time to sit and think about where you are, what you focus on. Are you doing discussion questions as a exam technique thing? Two weeks before the exam, do a couple. Making a skill your own is not I did four discussion questions. Making a skill your own is, this is just what I do. I need to go into that exam with 30, 40 discussion questions because this is just what I do. This is a skill that I own. Your skills are absolutely important. When I look at the pass rates for ITC, it's gut-wrenching. But in all honesty, it doesn't surprise me. It's heartbreaking, but I'm not shocked by it. Why? Because if you look at an exam where all the game factor has been removed and people are not comfortably passing it, there's a very clear indication that there's something that you're missing. You're focusing on something 
that's not quite going to get you where you need to go. I'm not denying, like, what you have to do is very hard. But I don't want you working really, really hard in the wrong direction. I need you working really, really hard in the right direction. What is your value add? What do people want from you? Take a step back before you carry on with your ITC prep, before you prep for the next exam. And the next exam is now going to be IAC. It's not going to be. So you know, everybody's kind of going, okay, what does that look like? Where we're, we can see what we're doing with that. We can see where that's going, which is like, we need to move close to the future. The, the exam, the style of the exam, the stuff that we want from you needs to be closer to the future and shifting away from the past. What does that mean for you? What is your value add? Before you jump back into the books, before you jump back into the board courses, before you jump back into the detail, take a step back and ask yourself, do I understand what's going on here? Do I know where we're going? What they want from me? And when I do start studying, am I comfortable that I'm working on the right stuff? that I'm spending my hours in the right places. It is a very, 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 very challenging situation that you find yourself in. But I need you to take your eyes off the past. If you're in CTA, one of the best things you can do is go and take a look at ITC exams at the moment. What do you need to be doing by the end of the year? You need to be close to that because that's what CTA is supposed to be preparing you for. So don't look at it and go, oh, well, I'm not ready for that. Oh, I'm in CTA now, like, oh, that scares me. Yes, of course it scares you, but there's no point in avoiding it. If you're writing CTA this year, you need to look at that stuff and go, okay, okay. So that's what will be expected from me next year. Am I on that track? I'm not saying you have to be able to pass ITC questions now, but are you on track? Are you, is that your trajectory? Are you moving in that direction? And you may find, oh, wait a minute, this is starting to feel familiar to some of the tests that I'm writing at the moment. I don't really know where these tests were coming from. They were freaking me out a little bit. But when I take a look at the ITC paper, I can see the influence of ITC in my CTA tests. Okay, now no. I want you to be empowered. I want you to take control. I want you to understand what's going on. And if your focus on your studying is based solely on the past, there's a lot of stuff that you're missing. And I feel like we're in a position where we very specifically have to look towards the past, look towards the future and make a choice.